Uh, so yeah, I'd just like to thank uh, the organizers for inviting me here. It's been uh, great to, uh, to come here. The weather is exactly the same as it is in Seattle right now. Um, and uh, I am going to talk about one of the PSI projects. So PSI is the Proteomic Standards Initiative under HUPO. And I'm going to talk about one of the projects that we're currently working on. Uh, this is not a project that's completely done yet. So there's still, it's, it's quite advanced, I would say. But um, there is still work to be done and participation to, uh, to be encouraged. So if you uh, uh, feel motivated to join this effort, I definitely encourage you to, uh, to do so. Okay, so I'm going to start with a little bit of motivation on why, or what this universal spectrum identifier is and why we'd want to do something like this. So um, there are many applications for which uh, individual mass spectra are very important for um, the conclusions of a paper. Often these are um, uh, papers that are trying to identify a particular protein or identify a particular post-translational modification or something along those lines. And for many years now, several of the journals, including MCP, the Molecular and Cellular Proteomics, um, requires annotated spectra to back up uh, some of these claims. Uh, MCP in particular is very concerned about quality and making sure that uh, accurate conclusions are, uh, um, are, are published based on the data that are available. And uh, the Human Proteome Project is a similar project um, to, well, sorry, is, is a project that has many different um, um, aspects to it, but one of them is to get uh, confident identifications of all of the human proteins. So we have a prediction of what we think the entire proteome is, but only about 80% or so after several years of effort have been conclusively identified as being translated naturally in human cells. And so there are several teams that are working to try to identify them all. And as you probably know, if you've uh, analyzed proteomics data, there is a, a problem of false discovery rates and false positives and things like that with pretty much any kind of data. Um, but if you are trying to detect novel things, novel translations, novel proteins, you want to make sure that um, even that the, the evidence that you have is not one of these false positives. And so the Human Proteome Project guidelines right now require that you provide the spectra that you are using as a claim for novel detection. And so I think just in general, um, some reviewers, not all reviewers, but some reviewers want to see these spectra and some readers of papers want to see these spectra to really make sure that the spectral evidence or that make sure that the conclusions that are being claimed are really supported by the spectral evidence. Um, unfortunately, often in these papers, the evidence looks something like this. You get kind of a spectrum, fuzzy spectrum, that's a little bit hard to read. And you're really not sure, is that really um, you know, a spectrum that really supports the conclusion that's being claimed? We've detected this protein that nobody else has detected anywhere. Um, you're skeptical, and it's hard to follow up on that. Um, so one possible solution is you just zoom in a little bit. But as you can see in this case, even if you just zoom in on this PDF here, it's still just not really uh, very useful. Um, there are many different spectrum viewers, uh, and they have different features, strengths, weaknesses. You know, sometimes I look at spectra like this, I'm used to a very different spectral viewer, and it's just kind of hard for me to decide, is this really accurately identifying the peptide that it's claiming to be? So often zooming in doesn't work. So the solution that we came up with a couple years ago and have been in the process of developing is this concept that we call a universal spectrum identifier. And the idea is that we can identify any spectrum in uh, any public data set uh, in sort of a compact way, in a way that we can communicate and say, I want to identify a particular spectrum and then also fetch it so that I can look at it closely. And so the idea is that if we implement this at all of the major data repositories, I hope most of you are familiar with the Pride data repository and maybe Peptide Atlas and Massive and some of the others, if we can get them all to implement a mechanism like this, then um, it should be easy to pull out spectra that you want to look at and then look at them closely with your own software. And so um, that's what we're trying to do. Um, there is something already in existence, which some of you may be familiar with. This is called a splash, the spectral hash identifier. Uh, 
Um, and this is actually used already in metabolomics repositories. If any of you have done any work with uh, metabolomics or metabolomics repositories, you may know that they, you may know about these splash identifiers. And essentially what they are is, so this is splash 1.0, and then there's some um, designation of the molecule, and then there's a hash. There's a hash that's computed from the actual spectrum um, in question. And it's basically designed for metabolomics reference spectra. So if you have one spectrum that you're claiming this is caffeine, let's say, this is what the, the spectrum of caffeine looks like. Um, if you have that same reference spectrum in a couple different repositories, you'd like to know, is this really the identically same spectrum or is it just another, a different spectrum of caffeine? And so this is the mechanism that they came up with. Uh, as I said, it's designed for metabolomics reference spectra not really designed for essentially all of the spectra out there. Um, and what it does critically require is this hashing algorithm. So they came up with a very specific ha hashing algorithm that converts a spectrum into a hash like this. Okay, and so you have to use obviously that algorithm if you're gonna be able to um, compare these with anyone else. Um, the problems we had with this, so this is existing, if you just Google for splash and spectral, you'll find a web page and they have algorithms that you can download in many of the popular languages. And this is pretty good. Um, but one of the problems that we had with this is that you would need to pre-compute hashes for essentially all of the spectra in your repository. So I run the Peptide Atlas repository and we have, well, billions of spectra really. And so if people wanna be able to refer to those spectra, I would need to pre-compute a hash for all of those billions of spectra and uh, store them so that if somebody came in with one of those, um, I would have to do a lookup then. I could do a lookup to see, do I have this spectrum or not? Um, and there is, uh, so uh, Juan Antonio at Pride, he uh, worked with, the, uh, experimented with this a little bit, and he came to the conclusion that with this hash identifier, that there could be collisions. Since we have billions of spectra, um, that there could be collisions, two different spectra could yield the same hash, and um, that is a potential problem. And then also one thing that I wasn't too enthralled with is that it requires, uh, it's basically a meaningless, visually meaningless. If you look at this, this gives you really no information except that it's a splash of version 1.0. Other than that, you really don't know what it stands for. And so this didn't really meet the, some of the goals that we had in mind for an identifier. And so I guess I'll tell you now about the USI and what we have come up with so far. And as I said, this is not fully, uh, fully set in stone yet, um, but it's, uh, I think, quite advanced. So the idea is instead of a hash that requires an algorithm to compute for a particular spectrum, the idea is that we would come up with a multi-part key that has different components of what you need to identify a spectrum. And essentially it has a little preamble, then it has a collection identifier, it has an MS run name, then it has an index type, and then an index number. And then that's all you need for the basic USI, but you could also potentially have an optional interpretation after that. So just as an example of one particular spectrum might look like this, so MZ spec, then the collection identifier is just a proteome exchange data set identifier, PXD, whatever the number is. You all familiar with proteome exchange and basically how that works? Yeah, okay. So within, within that data set, here is the run that was just given by the operator. And then in this case, um, there's the index flag says scan and it's referring to scan 10,951. So in principle, that is really all you need to know to pull out a particular scan event from one data set. Right? If you know the collection, you know the MS run, and you can tell me what scan it is, in theory, I should be able to, that uniquely identifies a spectrum that was generated somewhere, and I can refer to that, and I could potentially pull it from a repository. Yes? So, um, how do you distinguish this word, the local or antidepressant? Because you could just like, have the same file name, and one time have the local, and then have the second word, and the same result, the local, and the second file. It would maybe make a difference if another algorithm generates another, the same M7 alpha mm -hmm. without including the ending of your name. Yes. So I don't have it in my slides here, um, but in the official specification, you're actually allowed to put a dot right here and dot mzml dot raw dot something else, and you're you're allowed to specify which file you want to refer to. And so, for example, in um, 
in Massive, the Massive repository at UCSD. If you give it this key here, it will show you several different possibilities. It will show you this .raw, .mzml, .mzxml potentially. Um, there's one more thought. I have that in two slides. I have the second, the second part of the answer to your question in just two slides. Um, so the extension that I mentioned here, this optional interpretation basically looks something like this. This is to say that this same um, scan number, I'm going to suggest that this is the possible interpretation of that spectrum. It's not required. If you're just talking about a spectrum, you don't need that. <clears throat> but it seemed to us that it was actually quite useful to be able to say, I wanna to refer to this particular spectrum and I think this is what, uh, what the interpretation is. And you'll see a bit more about that in a second. Okay, so this is the basic design. There are actually lots of details. It's a long, kind of a long specification. There are lots of little details. I'm gonna talk about some of them. We can talk about other ones. I'm happy to over the week talk about even more of them or share the document with you so you can read all about it. Uh, I'm gonna give a little bit of a, just a high level overview right now. Um, so, something that I just alluded to and maybe didn't say is the USI is, it's an abstract path really to an original scan event. So it's maybe slightly misnamed as a spectrum identifier. It's not necessarily an exact spectrum identifier, as you alluded to. It's more of a reference to that original scan event. And it's possible that there could be some downstream subtle changes or different representations, I would say a profile mode or a peak picked, or maybe even de-isotoped, um, we're really referring to this original scan event. It's not an exact fingerprint of a particular instance of that original scan event, which is really what a splash is. A splash will give you a hash key that says you're guaranteed, if you have the same hash key, except for collisions, this is the exact form of the spectrum that I'm talking about. Um, I thought, or we thought for um, what we want to accomplish, it's really the scan event that we want to refer to. And we don't care quite so much about exactly what representation of that spectrum you have. In principle, you should get the same identification from no matter what representation of that spectrum that you have. That's not always true. And of course, we can argue about that. And that's one of the useful things for having this identification. You could have a conversation. You could argue about, you know, what does the spectrum really represent? But the one thing that you can really be, you know, uh, can get a handle on is this original scan event. That is something that happened that you want to refer to. Okay, so implementations. Um, I mentioned this is not done yet, but we have several implementations. So they're essentially complete, except for little details that um, I'll mention a few of, but um, we can also talk during the week more if you're interested. We have implementations at Pepper Atlas in Seattle and at this massive repository at UCSD, University of California, San Diego. Um, and uh, Pride now has, uh, I guess, a uh, close to finished um, implementation of it, I would say, is that right? Yeah. 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 Okay. Um, the spectrum viewer at each resource will, re will display the USI for any spectrum that um, you pull up in the resource. I'll show you that in a minute. And then also users can enter any valid USI and the repositories will look to see if they have that spectrum. They're of course not guaranteed to have that spectrum, but you can, they will look and they will present that spectrum. Um, in the case of Peptide Atlas and Massive, irrespective of whether that spectrum actually passes quality filters. So in Peptide Atlas, we have assembled billions of spectra, we've searched them, we have a smaller subset for which we have, we think, confident identifications. But you can actually ask Peptide Atlas for a spectrum for which we don't claim to have a confident identification, and we'll still show it to you. And if you suggest an interpretation, we'll show you that suggested interpretation. So uh, it basically looks like this. This is a screenshot of a page at Peptide Atlas. Um, at the top here, it's probably a little hard to see in the background, but there's a little box where you can paste one of these USIs. And then if we have it, then um, Peptide Atlas will show you, in, using this lorikeet spectrum viewer here, it will show you the complete spectrum. You can zoom in, you can um, see, you know, you can change fiddle with all the controls, and you can really take a deep look at that spectrum. And in fact, there are some additional um, workbench features down below here, not on the screenshot, that allows you to do some other fun things with that spectrum. Uh, but, yeah, I was put my data set to a distinct um, 
um, repository like Pride or something else, third repository or repository, they would treat the GSI as it would be for instance for one particular um, spectrum and then several uh, GSI then also. That can potentially happen. In in principle, the idea is no. So that, that's we want to make it universal. And the idea is if there's a PXD, right? So the main collection identifier is this PXD identifier. And so for those of you not familiar with Proteome Exchange, essentially the way it works is there are six different repositories, Cuphead Atlas, Massive, JPost, Pride. We all get our identifiers from the same place. So there's a resource called Proteome Central and it gives out data set identifiers and all of those resources use those data set identifiers. And so if you deposit something to Pride, then when in Pepe Atlas, we're in the business of reprocessing data sets. We get that data set from Pride, we download it, we reprocess it, but we associate that PXD number, the original PXD number with that, uh, with that data set. And so if we have downloaded it and reprocessed it, then you can see that spectrum with the same identifier in Peppad Atlas or at Massive. So there are a couple of little asterisks um, associated with that, which I'll talk a little bit about. But in principle, it should be the same universal identifier. That's what makes it universal at all of the repositories. OK, so here it's just zoomed in. Actually, this is a different spectrum. Again, now you can actually read it. So here it is, PXD 2286. This was originally deposited at Pride. We downloaded it. We reprocessed it. Um, here is the, uh, the, uh, the MS run name, the scan number, and then here is our interpretation. So we came to the spectrum just by browsing through the Peptide Atlas repository. I was just looking at a certain protein, a certain peptide, in this case a phosphorylated peptide. And in Peptide Atlas, you can um, view any of the spectra that are in the resource. I brought up the spectrum viewer and it filled out, this is what the universal spectrum identifier is for the spectrum that you're looking at, okay? And you can take that, in principle, you could then take this, copy this, and you could go to Massive, or you could go to a different repository that also contains this data set, and you could paste it in there, and you could use their tool. Yes? The identification, um, the optional identification, mm -hmm. would be different between Bright and uh, Pepper Network. Yes, right. So the... Yes, so what we show here is the identification that we currently have in Peptide Atlas. If you went to a different resource and you just entered in this, the scan number or everything up until the scan number, you might, depending on how that repository implemented it, just see the spectrum or maybe see the spectrum with the interpretation that's in that repository. Or if you did the full one, then you would presumably see that spectrum overlaid with this identification that you propose. Yes? But it's not possible that I would enter a new resource there and it would already attack my system. Like if I would say the population is not on the terrain but uh, on the team, could I do that? Absolutely. Yes, so the way our system, and I, you're not guaranteed to have the same behavior at every repository, I would say. So there's some flexibility in how different repositories wish to implement this. But at Peptide Atlas, if you change this around, you change the position of the phospho, then it will reload the spectrum and it will annotate it the way you have suggested it. Yes? Yes, so, um, so as far as multiple different interpretations, uh, mutually exclusive interpretations, those would be two different USIs. But if you're proposing a chimeric spectrum, again, it's not in my slides, but it's in the specification, you can actually put a plus here and you could put a second one. Now, having said that, it's in the specification, but we don't support that. So if you were to put a plus and another spectrum here, our viewer would go, eh, I can't do anything with that, but it's in the specification. If you wanted to do that, that's how you would refer to it. And maybe someday software will support it. And the same thing actually with cross-linking, we just put in recently in the specification, a mechanism for how to specify true cross-link uh, cross peptides. Again, none of the viewers can handle it yet, and it's not finalized yet, but in principle, we're thinking about it and how you would do that. Okay, so let's see. Oh, so here's just, I guess, the same spectrum. Here's the same spectrum here that I just showed you at, at Massive. So you can go there and you can see the spectrum there. 
Okay, so um, this goes back to your question here. Um, we were just using this. Uh, so one way that you could use this is about discussions about what's the proper ID. And so this was just an email that I uh, copy pasted with a colleague of mine. Uh, we were looking at PTM profit, comparing PTM profit versus PTMRS. These are two software tools for localization of PTMs. And we were looking at this one particular spectrum here. In this case, the phospho is on the serine. In this case, the phospho is on the tyrosine. These two software tools um, were in disagreement. And you can take this uh, string here and you can paste it into our viewer up here. And you will, in one case, see it with the one interpretation, in another case, with the other interpretation. And you can blink back and forth. And then you can have an argument on what you think the correct interpretation is. Um, here's another uh, example that I think is kind of neat. You can use this retroactively. Um, so here's an example. So MCP is molecular and cellular proteomics. This is a journal. There's a paper that was published, oh, I don't know, I guess uh, November 2018 called PT Minor. And it was, you know, introducing this new tool and they had some spectra that they were showing and they were making some point. And so this is a particular spectrum that I kind of just copied out of the journal. And, you know, I find it difficult I'm not used to this tool, but I'm, you know, I have difficult looking at this, but it's kind of fun. They provide the exact, um, actually the DTA file. I don't know if anyone still uses DTA files, but this is kind of the string of the way Sequest and maybe a Proteome Discoverer still does it, the way it describes a particular spectrum. And it includes the MS run, it includes the scan number, and it includes the charge here. And so you can actually then create a, a USI from that. So I know what data set it was. It happened to be PXD 561. And then here is the run. Here is the scan number. And here is the string, or here is the peptide that they propose the identification is. So it's a little bit of a hassle, but I can build this from a paper that's already published. I can build a USI out of that. I can paste it into Peptide Atlas. And then I can look at it in my own viewer that I'm comfortable with to see, oh yeah, this looks like a great identification. It's not obvious to me from this representation that that's a great identification, but when I look at it in my own comfortable environment, I can see, oh yeah, that's right. Okay, there are some complications, uh, actually many complications, but I will go through just one, I think one quickly or two quickly. Uh, one complication that maybe we could spend hours talking about is MGFs. So a lot of people convert their MZMLs to MGF files or the raw files directly to MGF files. And often the original scan information is lost during that conversion. It doesn't have to be. There is an MGF um, uh, keyword called scans, I think. So in, if a good converter keeps that scan information, it should still be in there. And if the software that you're using with that MGF file has, um, has uh, a way to use that scan information, then it should still be preserved. Some converters actually put the scan number in the title string in an MGF. So there are ways to keep it, but it seems like often during conversion it's lost. So that's, I think that's the biggest problem that we're facing. Um, I would argue that that's something that we should fix. We always wanna be able to know for any spectrum that we're interpreting, we really wanna link it back to the original data. Um, the other issue that we're struggling with currently is um, this is mostly sort of a thermocentric world where we just have one scan number that identifies a spectrum. Um, but there are several other vendors like SciX and well, I guess actually most of the other vendors where just a single scan number doesn't identify one spectrum. And we installed this many years ago in MZML, the MZML format. We had this thing called a native ID where within each spectrum in the MZML, there is a, uh, what's called a, a native ID string that is the full name. Instead of just a scan number, it's actually the full name for that spectrum. And in fact, for thermophiles, there are actually three numbers that uniquely identify a spectrum in there. There's a controller type, there's a controller number, and then the scan. Turns out for mass spectra, controller type and controller number, they're always exactly the same. Um, and so scan number is really enough. But for example, for SciX, there are actually four numbers that specify a particular spectrum. There's a sample, a period, a cycle, and an experiment. And it's actually this combination of four numbers that you would need to identify a particular spectrum. So this is still something that we're wrestling with. If you have interest in 
in discussing it. I'd be happy to talk about it at some point. Um, there are lots of little edge cases, um, many of which are described in the specification document as uh, already, and there are some that maybe we haven't thought yet about, and then maybe you could uh, bring them to our attention. I think one of the other things that would be especially cool to be able to do um, is to have or to enable independent spectrum analysis applications. So um, I've seen a couple already. Some people have cool uh, spectrum viewers or they have sort of de novo spectrum interpretation applications, um, but they only have a limited access to a certain amount of data. Um, with this universal spectrum identifier, I sort of envision a system where some user, users could come with universal spectrum identifiers, go to an independent spectrum analysis application, it doesn't have to be at PEPAD Atlas or at Pride, and they could paste in this USI. This resource probably doesn't have those data locally, but if they could then talk to Proteom Exchange, Proteom Central, and then reach out to the individual repositories and say, hey, somebody just asked me for this particular spectrum. I want to do something with it. Can you give it to me? And one of these repositories, at least, can furnish that individual spectrum, return it back to the application, and then the user has access to that data. And they can do some de novo on it, or they can do some PTM localization on just that one spectrum, or they can consider different interpretations, um, consider if it's a chimeric spectrum, perhaps. Um, I think that's something that will be enabled, could be enabled by this system. One thing it does require, though, is kind of an API underneath all of this to be able to do the spectrum querying and passing. And so I just want to mention briefly in one slide that we're also working as part of this overall project on this thing called Proxy. So Proxy is an API that is for querying and for fetching uh, proteomics data. Um, it uses this open API specification here, open API mechanism to be able to query by data set or query by protein or query by peptide ion or query by spectrum ID in the form of a spectral identifier and ask individual repositories, please give me information based on this. This is what I have, this is what I want. And so we're actually funded to do this and um, Pride and Peptide Atlas and Massive, we have a three-way grant where we're getting funded to implement this and it is well on its way, it's not done yet, but um, we've definitely made some good progress on it. And maybe uh, throughout the week, we can show you some more what, uh, what we have. Yasset is very heavily involved in this as well. Um, and then one other thing that I wanted to mention here is spectral libraries. Again, just very briefly. Um, the question is, can we use the same mechanism to reference spectra in spectral libraries? So, so far I've promoted the USI as a mechanism for referencing uh, spectra in data sets, an original data set, but as you know, many people are generating spectral libraries, NIST, and um, uh, we are generating spectral libraries, and Proteomics DB, and other people like that. Wouldn't it be cool if we could use the same mechanism to reference a particular spectrum in a spectrum library? And so the idea is to piggyback on this and have essentially the same mechanism, but instead of an MS run, which is not really relevant, we stuck in, at least for discussion purposes, this version tag. So it would look something like this. There would be the same collection identifier. In this case, instead of a PXD, there might be a PXL. Then instead of an MS run, there would be a version tag, and I'll come back to that in a minute. And then again, an index, and then the index number in that library. And so, um, this would require a kind of a central clearinghouse for spectral libraries. I think this is possible. Um, I'll say a minute, uh, let's see, actually I have the next slide here. This is something that I'm proposing. This has not been fully implemented. We have sort of a test version of it that we're playing around with. Um, we have a mechanism at Proteum Central where we can register libraries. And so you see here, these are many libraries from the, U.S. National Institute of Standards and Technology. Many of you may be familiar with these libraries. These are consensus libraries. These are um, a library of spectra for which they think at least the identification is known. And if we have a mechanism like this, that would enable, again, referencing a particular spectrum in a library. 
And furthermore, that would also enable you, as you're building this library, if you wanted to preserve the information for this particular consensus spectrum in this library, these are the original spectra that they came from, that it was derived from, those could be the basically the scan event USIs, right? So you could use the data set, the data original scan event USIs in your library to refer to the source data that was used to create a consensus spectrum that is in your reference library. Um, so also as part of the same project that Pride and Massive and Pet that Atlas are funded for, we're also trying to come up with this uh, PSI spectral library format. And there is a poster that uh, uh, Ralph has put together, right? Um, outside on the walling, I saw it on my way in. So I won't say any more about it. If you're interested in a PSI spectral library format, talk to Ralph or me or go look at the poster or all three. Um, so that's it. So I have just a few questions here to leave you with. Um, as I mentioned, this is not done. We've done a lot of work. I think um, this is well on its way. I'm pretty happy with where it is and where it's going. Um, but we would very much like to hear your thoughts on how useful you think this is or suggestions that you may have. Uh, we would encourage you to support USIs in your tools if you find it interesting. We've implemented it, as I said, at several repositories. Um, but I would love to see many more tools implement this uh, as well. Uh, and if you're so motivated, we have uh, weekly or every couple of weekly calls where we continue to push this forward. There are specification documents. Uh, if you're interested, I would be happy to send you those specification documents for you to read and have a look at. And if anybody wants to actually contribute some code, some reusable classes that embody the universal spectrum identifier in your favorite language, that would be, uh, that would be awesome. So I'll end there with some thank yous. Uh, these are the folks where I come from in uh, working on Pet Atlas and the TPP and the Moritz Lab. And then these are many of the people that have been working on a uh, weekly basis on the USI and many other projects and funding, of course. And thank you to those who brought me here. Thank you.